Well, good evening. I'd like to once again welcome you to the house of the Lord. We're going to begin with the hymn number 364. And if you need a hymn book, then please just uh, raise your hand. And I know one of the men can get a hymn book uh, to you. Uh, Don't worry, a hymn book's on its way. But 364, it's on the page number 323. Uh, A beautiful hymn regarding the peace of God. It's a subject we're going to be looking at very soon tonight. Peace like a river is flooding my soul. Since Christ my Savior maketh me whole, sweet peace abiding, my portion shall be. Jesus my Savior is precious to me. 364 will stand as we sing together, please. Let's all stand. Amen. That's lovely singing of a beautiful hymn. Oh, precious Jesus, how lovely thou art. It's true, isn't it? It's good to be saved. It's good to know that he's precious. But we're going to come before the Lord in a word of prayer now, please. So let's still our hearts together as we approach the throne of God. Let us pray. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we come before thee tonight and We thank Thee for the freedom and the liberty to gather in Thy house. Thou knowest that today largely has been a strange day for Thy people in Money Slain, but nonetheless we thank Thee for it. We thank Thee and we already can say tonight that we believe we have met with Thee. We believe we have met with Thee in the pre-service prayer meeting. We believe we have sensed Thy presence even as we sing of the loveliness and the preciousness of Christ. We thank Thee that there's nobody else like Him. We thank Thee that He is precious. We thank Thee that Solomon, so many years ago now, he he could write of Christ. Yea, He is altogether lovely. 
And we thank Thee that He could go on from that statement and say, this is my beloved and this is my friend. Oh, Father, we thank Thee for each and every one of Thy children with their heads bowed. And they can say as their testimony tonight, there was a day and hour when I was saved. There was a time when I trusted Christ. There was a time when my sins were washed away. And I can say tonight at this gospel meeting that this lovely one, this altogether lovely one, is most definitely my beloved. And he is my friend. And Lord, we do pray if there's anyone here, either in the building or listening from the car park or later on listening online, and if they cannot yet say that this is my beloved and this is my friend, then Lord, we pray, save them tonight. Do a work in their hearts. Revive even thy people's soul through thy truth this evening. And may we have much cause to rejoice knowing that thy will has been done, knowing that God has come down, knowing that it was good to be here, for here we met with the Master. O oh God, give us help even in our worship of thee tonight. But O oh God, even as we think about thy people and we think about those that maybe are suffering at this time, Lord, we do think of Mrs. Kearns and Frank and Whitney and the girls at this time. Lord, we pray that thou comfort their sorrowing hearts. Lord, we, we miss our brother. We thank thee for his long ministry. We thank thee for the blessing he has been to each one of thy children in this denomination over so many years. And Lord, we thank thee that now he's seen the face of the Lord. He's rejoicing. He's absent from the body and present with the Lord. But nonetheless, it's not easy for those that are left behind. And we pray comfort the sorrowing heart at this time. Undertake for their need. Lord, we do pray that thou touch even those members of our own congregation that are laid aside with sickness or with this virus especially at this time. We pray that thou, thou wilt heal them. Thou art the great physician. Thou canst do what no other can do. And we pray that the healing touch of the Master may be seen in each one. And we ask that they may be encouraged in their own hearts, but that we may be able to stand back and say, the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. But, O oh God, we do pray that thou would help us very especially in thy worship tonight. Thou knowest the, uh, if the devil had his way, then we would be prone to discouragement and, and all of those things. But, Lord, we do ask from the outset of this meeting, Put the devil out of it. Lord, we pray that thou kick him out of the church doors and out of the car park gates with his tail between his legs, knowing that he's a defeated foe. And we pray that each one may know that Christ is king. He is the sole king and head of his church, and we are his church. Therefore, help us to exalt Christ and Christ alone, and not to be ashamed to own our Lord tonight. But, Lord, we do pray, move in our midst. Have thine own way. Thy will be done, we plead. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you have a copy of God's Word, I would encourage you to turn with me, please, to John's Gospel, chapter 14. John's Gospel, chapter 14. We're going to read the first six verses together, and then we're going to jump down to the verse 22 and read down to the end of the verse 27. These are familiar words to us, ought to be a great encouragement for God's people tonight. But John chapter 14, beginning at the verse 1, let us hear the word of the Lord together. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by 
me. And then the verse 22, please, the word of God goes on and says, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, to bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. Now, could I uh, just welcome each and every one of you to the house of God tonight? It's lovely to see you once again. As already has been said today, we are uh, severely down in number, but that was largely expected after we closed for the last 14 days. But we do trust the Lord will bless us tonight, bless those that have come into the car park, and also bless those that are going to be listening online as well. And we'd also like to visit those visiting with us tonight as well. And we trust the Lord will bless you as you fellowship with us tonight at Money Slane. Now, please remember the meetings in the week that lies ahead. Wednesday, the Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m. in the church hall. We, in the will of the Lord, will be continuing on with our series in the book of Nehemiah. Then on Thursday, the workers' prayer meeting at 8 p.m. We'll have that in the annex uh, I think, and then uh, on Friday evening, there'll be no youth fellowship because Friday evening, presbytery has been planned for that night. So please remember these things for the week that lies before us. The services next Lord's Day, Sabbath school at 10.45, the morning worship at 12 noon, preceded by a half-hour prayer at 11.30, and then the evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by prayer at 6.30. Now today, uh, please feel free to give for the retiring missionary offering because we missed it last week. But then next week will be the Whitfield College Covenant offering. Please remember that. Then for members of session and committee, there is a provisional date being set for those meetings Monday night, the 16th of November, if you could pencil that in into your diaries. Please do pray for the sick and for the elderly and the bereaved at this time. Please do especially remember Mrs. Kearns, uh, Frank and Whitney and the girls. Frank and Whitney, of course, are still in the United States. They weren't able to get over for the funeral uh, in Ballygown yesterday. But please pray for the family that they'll know God's touch. And please pray for those among our own congregation that has been, uh, have been laid aside in recent weeks. Pray that the Lord would heal them, touch them, and that very soon they'll be back in our number again. But all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. We're going to take our hymn books again, please, and we're going to sing uh, 357, 357, uh, the page number 321. I've cast my heavy burdens down on Canaan's happy shore. I'm living where the healing waters flow. I'll wander in the wilderness of doubt and sin no more. I'm living where the healing waters flow. A beautiful old hymn. We'll sing it with all our hearts. 357, please. Let's all stand as we sing.
amen. And I wonder, can you have that as your testimony? I'm singing hallelujah. Safely anchored is my soul. And I wonder what beautiful truth that is. Can you say this? I'm resting on his promises. The blood has made me whole. I'm living where the healing waters flow. I trust if it's not your testimony yet, that it will be before we end tonight and that you'll trust Jesus Christ as your own and personal Savior. Now we're turning back in the Word of God to John's Gospel, chapter 14. John's Gospel, chapter 14. And I'd like to draw your attention to the last verse we read together, the verse 27. Beautiful promise we have here. And we're going to look at the title very simply, Genuine Peace. Genuine Peace. And look what it says, John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. With the word of God open before us, we'll seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer once again, please. Let us all bow before the Master. Heavenly Father, we seek thy face again tonight, and we pray that thou undertake for the need. We pray that we may know that Almighty God is speaking unto our hearts. We pray that thou would have a word in season for each and every soul listening to the word tonight. And we pray that each one that listens may know what it is to have that genuine peace that alone comes from thee. O oh God, save souls and encourage thy people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> genuine peace. Now in 2020, we are mindful this Remembrance Sunday that it was 75 years since the end of World War II. Over six years before the end of the Second World War on the 30th of September uh, 1938, the then Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain came home from the Munich Agreement waving a piece of paper, uh, peace in our time, peace in our time. Well, sadly, that wasn't to be, because in the years that were to soon follow from that date in 1938, throughout to the end of the Second World War on the 2nd of September, 1945. There had been no peace in our time. In fact, there had been a conflict, a conflict that involved 30 countries, three continents, and took into account the deaths of approximately 75 million people. Peace in our time. Sadly, it was not. And what we find in John chapter 14 and the verse 27 is not one of those false statements, peace in our time. What we read here is genuine peace. What we find here is the end of a conflict. It isn't just a, a promised peace and a, and a declared peace and a peace that we will never see or never uh, feel, but it is a peace that is genuine between both God and man and um, what a peace this is. Look what it says. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. You see, the Lord makes a, a distinction there, which we'll look at in more detail in a few moments. But not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Genuine peace. I want you to look with me firstly. We find the comfort from this genuine peace. The comfort. Look what it says at the start of the verse 27. Peace I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. Now, surely that ought to be the desire of each and every heart tonight, to have peace within our souls, to have peace in our hearts, to have peace in our lives. But by the very fact that the Lord himself saying, peace I leave with you, that indicates that we didn't have peace. It indicates that there was no peace before the Lord had spoken and before the Lord has moved and before the Lord has said these things and performed this action. Well, if there was no peace, that means there was war. That means there was conflict. 
That means there was fighting and there was turmoil. And where did this war originate? Well, this war originated in heaven. Come with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. I'd like you all to turn there, please, and uh, and look at these verses that we turn to. It's important so that we understand the thrust of the message. Uh, And we find in Revelation chapter 12 and the verses 7 through to 11, we read about a war. And we read that God started the war. And we find that it is the Lord that promises peace. But at the same time, it was the Lord that started the war. And what a strange thing that is. But, but why did he start this war? Because the devil, Lucifer, had sinned against God. He had sinned against God. He had defied God with his pride in heaven's glory. And God kicked him out. We find in Revelation chapter 12... Verse 7, it says, And there was war in heaven. What solemn words they are. There was war in heaven. Look what it says, verse 7. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, and look at it now, which deceiveth the whole world. So there we find the battleground changes. There we find the war started in heaven, verse 7, but now we find the war continues and he deceiveth the whole world in the verse 9. It says in verse 9, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So there we find not only is there a war, the war started in heaven, the war is in earth, but there we find we too are embroiled in this warfare because he is the accuser of us, the Christian, the brethren. And it says in the verse 11, and they overcame him. There we find victory. There we find our peace, the Lord is talking about, peace through victory. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So when the Lord says back in our text in John 14, peace I leave with you, this indicates that there wasn't peace and there hasn't been peace for a long time and there was no peace because a war was declared. And you know, sadly, in all of these things, For a long time, we were on the wrong side. If you're a Christian, then you can say, I'm now on the Lord's side. But for a long time, I was on the wrong side. Maybe you're here and you're not yet saved. And you haven't repented and believed the gospel. And you know that your sins still aren't forgiven. Then, my friend, you're still on the wrong side. You're still on the losing side of this battle. You're still on the devil's side because... The Word of God tells us, we looked at it this morning, that we sinned in Adam. We rebelled in Adam. The Word of God tells us further to that, that we individually and personally have sinned against God for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in Romans chapter 3, we're told that through the law, a judge will make a declaration and all the mouths of all the world will be stopped and made guilty before God. What solemn things they are. We found ourselves on the wrong side. Come with me to Romans chapter 6 initially, please. Romans chapter 6. I want you to look at the consequences of being on the wrong side. You see, there is no peace for the sinful man. There there is no peace if you endeavor to stay in your iniquities, stay in your wickedness, stay in that defiance against God, stay on the devil's side, Then, then there is no peace left with you. And we find ultimately what your end will be if you stay in your sin. Romans 6 verse 23 states, For the wages of sin, the reward for sin, the consequences of being on the wrong side is death. That's what the Word of God says. But there is hope. Look at the rest of the verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But ultimately, we see the consequences of being 
on the wrong side. Turn over a page to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and the verse 7 now. We find something further to all of this. And you say, well, there was a war. We are embroiled in this war. In our sin, we find ourselves on the wrong side. And ultimately, it's summed up here in Romans 8 verse 7. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Do you understand what we've just read? The word carnal means fleshly. You're living after the flesh, living after the pleasures of sin for a season, living after what the world can offer you, living after what the devil has promised you, like he promised the Lord in those temptations in the Gospels. And, and it says, for to be carnally minded, to be fleshly minded, to be worldly minded and sinful minded is death. And that's what the verse 6 says. And it says, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity. What's that mean? Enmity means active hostility. It's not just hostility. It's not just being hostile, but it is active hostility. It is a deliberate endeavor to be against God, against God's law, against all that God is for, against righteousness, against His Christ. And to be carnally minded is enmity, is us then declaring war on God. And then look at the verse 7 again. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You see, the carnal mind, carnal mind has no time for the law of God, no time for the Ten Commandments, no time for God's rulings and decrees, and it is enmity against God. You see, this is our problem. This is our issue. There, there was no peace for us. There was no, no uh, stillness. There was nothing that the verse, uh, our text in verse 27 of chapter 14 of John's gospel tells us, peace I leave with you. We, we didn't know what that was. We didn't understand it. We didn't have it in our souls. But you know, my friend, the turning point was Calvary. We're still in the book of Romans, so look at Romans chapter 5 in the verse 1. You know, the turning point is Calvary. Oh, what, what a wonderful truth this is, because yes, the Lord is leaving us His peace, and that therefore indicates that we had no peace, we had conflict, we were on the wrong side, we were going to face the judgment that comes with being at enmity with God, but we find because a Savior came, because Christ died on the cross, because the blood was shed, that now Romans 5 verse 1 states, therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand what we're reading there? That word justification is a beautiful word. It's a legal term. We were looking at legal terms this morning. Righteousness is a legal term. Unrighteousness is a legal term. Well, basically to be justified means we were stood in our rags, stood in our shame, stood in our sin and our unrighteousness, stood on the wrong side in this warfare, and we find that a Savior has come, a Savior has lived a righteous life, a Savior has died a righteous death, a Savior has been resurrected from the dead and is alive forevermore. And at Calvary, justification is that great transaction when our unrighteousnesses were put to His account and His righteousness was put to our account. And that's what it's meaning to be justified. In that day and hour when we repent and believe the gospel, we find that then and only then we have peace with God. We've changed sides. For us, the war with God is over. No longer should we be carnally minded. No longer should we be at enmity with God. No longer should the death of hell cause us fear. Oh, what beautiful words in our text. John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. If you're saved tonight, then be encouraged in this. You have the peace of God. The war is over. The armistice has been declared. Peace in our time. But my friend, 
Listen to me as I say this. If you're not saved, and if you haven't repented and believed the gospel, if as yet you're still on the wrong side, then there is no peace for those that defy the Lord. But here we find a promise to God's people, peace I leave with you. The comfort from this genuine peace. But then secondly, I want you to note from the text, the care in this genuine peace. The care in this genuine peace. Look what it says now. Uh, And this is very important. If you're in the habit of marking your Bible, I want you to underline two words now. My peace. I want you to mark that so you don't forget it. We read, peace I leave with you, but then it says, my peace I give unto you. You see, there's a distinction there between peace and then the Lord's peace. There's a distinction between the world's peace and the Lord's peace. You see, this is not just any peace, but this is God's peace. This is peace that He has given. He has bestowed. My peace I give unto you. Here we're reading of a God-given peace. But what does that mean? Why is it different? What is the difference between uh, my peace and just... Uh, Any ordinary peace, or in fact, the world's peace that the Lord says, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Oh, what's the difference in all of this? Well, we find in the world, and we'll look at it in a little more detail in a few moments, but generally speaking, the world has a false peace, uh, a, a peace that isn't real, a peace that isn't genuine. It's It's far from being genuine. We find that the world, still in their sin, still at enmity with God, still in this warfare, still in the wrong side of the battle, still facing judgment, still with the wages of sin being death against them. And it is still in this condition that the world says, I have peace. It's not genuine. It's not real. It will not come to fruition. You see, the Lord's peace is different from the world's peace. Now, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 6. You know, sadly, preachers have been preaching a false peace for many years. And long, long, long before our nation was ever thought about, we find in Israel of old, Jeremiah the prophet, he's declaring the word of the Lord. And we find that Jeremiah touches on this in a sermon he preaches Jeremiah chapter 6 and the verses 13, 14, and 15, he talks about a false peace that has been proclaimed from the world, and it is a peace that will not last. Now, for those of you that have been listening to the studies in both Ezra and Nehemiah, you will know that Israel sinned against God, and Israel sinned against God to such an extent that God sent judgment. And that judgment was a 70-year captivity in the land of Babylon. And we find Jeremiah is warning the people of God. And Jeremiah is saying, there is no peace. If you continue in your sin, if you continue in your rebellion, if you continue in your worldliness, then conflict will come, slavery will come, bondage will arrive. But yet in Jeremiah's day, as Jeremiah is endeavoring to proclaim the truth, There are literally hundreds around him that are saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Look what it says in Jeremiah 6 verse 13. It says, for from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. That's the problem in Israel at the time. There is sin. Didn't matter how poor they were or how rich and noble they were, every single one of them had a greedy heart. And then look what it says in the verse 13, And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. Sounds familiar today, doesn't it? When we look at pulpits around our land, every one dealeth falsely. Verse 14, look what it says. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now, look at it there in the verse 14. It says, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. You know, every time someone goes into an apostate church and has their ears tickled, oh, it it helps for a time. 
It's like a plaster over a scar that needs stitches. It's no good. But it gives you that feel-good factor. You, you feel as if you've heard something. You, you feel as if you're on the Lord's side. Yes, yes, it's encouraged me slightly, but it's doing you no good to hear those lies. And they find what they're proclaiming, peace, peace. And Jeremiah says, when there is no peace, bondage is coming, judgment is coming, a foreign army is coming, Israel will be no more. There is judgment coming on the land and everyone around is declaring that there is going to be peace. Then in the verse 15 it says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? When they sinned so severely against the Lord? Were they ashamed? Did they blush at their sin? Look what it says. Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them the fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Listen, my friend, there may be those, and they may preach peace. They may preach that you go to church, you'll be all right. They may preach good works will save you. They may preach this thing, that thing, and the other thing. But if they don't preach Christ, then they're preaching peace, peace, when there is no peace. But here we find Jeremiah, and he's saying for those individuals that are relying on that false peace, relying on that peace that is not real and is not genuine, they will fall among them, the fall, and they will fall when? Look at the verse 15 again. They shall fall at the time that I visit them they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Because you see, there's no peace from the Lord. They're carnally minded and there's still an enmity with God. And God is going to come. The Lord is going to visit them and they will be cast down. Therefore, it is important that we have not just any peace, but it's vital that we have my peace, the Lord's peace, God's peace, genuine. But then, it wasn't only the case in our day, in Jeremiah's day. But turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and the verse 3. And you ask, well, is anything going to change? If it was that way literally thousands of years ago in Jeremiah's day, and it's still like that in 2020, what about when the Lord returns? Is it going to be any different then? No, my friend, it's going to be no different. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're reading about the Lord's return. We're reading that Christ is coming again. We're reading that this conflict will end, and it will end with victory for the Lord. And look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3. For when they shall say, this is what the preachers and the apostasy are going to say at the time of the Lord's return. For when they shall say, peace and safety. Oh yes, it'll be all right. As long as you keep going to church. As long as you have your good works. As long as you give generously to the church bank account. As long as you do this, that and the other. Sure, don't worry about it. There'll be peace and there'll be safety. Well, look what it says, verse 3. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Oh, you see the importance of genuine peace, peace with God. And sadly, it doesn't matter whether you look back through the pages of history or whether you look forwards into prophetic days, men are still the same. Men will be full of apostasy. Men will be preaching a false peace. But for the people of God and for the people that love the Lord, there is only one peace worth having, and that is my peace, as it is described in John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. You know, my friend, we've looked an awful lot at, at the false peace that is out there. But come with me to Philippians chapter 4 and the verse 7. Just listen to a description of genuine peace. 
Listen to the difference here. Listen to to what the Lord has to offer when he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Just look at it in Philippians chapter 4 and the verse 7. What, What beautiful descriptions were given here. It says, look at this verse, Philippians 4 verse 7, and the peace of God. Now, it's the same peace. It's the genuine peace. And the peace of God, look at it, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, there we find one description uh, initially. This peace of God, well, it passeth all understanding. Oh, we don't understand it when we think of our rebellion, when we think of our sin, when we think of our our iniquities against God and the way we have shaken our fist at God and told God we have no time for Him as we joined in the devil's ranks and we are fighting on the wrong side for so many years and we defied Him time and time and time again. Isn't it wonderful to know that when He saves and when He gives you this peace, yes, we can say, that this peace of God, it surely passeth all understanding. We don't understand why the Lord would give it. I don't understand why the Lord would save me. I don't understand why the Lord would ever set His love upon me, but He has. And therefore, this love passeth all understanding, this peace passeth all understanding. And further to that, we have peace with God. We may not have a clue why He's chosen us, but look at this in the verse 7 of Philippians 4 again. And this peace shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How often our hearts are troubled. We'll come to this in a few moments. But our hearts are often troubled. We're burdened with sorrow. We're burdened with that feeling, that that churning when we know there's a warfare going on and and we know the devil and the powers of hell are against us and we feel the darkness at times. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. But the peace of God cannot be substituted. There's nothing like it. And this peace is the peace that keeps our hearts. This is the peace that calms us. This is the peace that keeps our minds and stills us. Here we find the comfort, peace I leave with you. And there we find the care, my peace I give unto you. But then I I want to come back to this theme of false peace, and and I want to look with you thirdly at the verse, uh, the caution concerning genuine peace. We find the comfort, the care, now the caution And it says, going down in the verse, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Now, many of you have heard it. I hear it numerous times. You only have to switch on the news. And many liberals in their fanciful world with with rainbows and unicorns will talk about world peace. They'll talk about world peace as if it's something that they think they will establish with their immoral agendas and their treaties and their agreements and and all the rest of it. Well, listen, my friend, there will never be world peace until the Lord comes again. And when every enemy is placed under his feet, that's when world peace will come. That's when there is peace, only when God's peace reigns upon the earth and we reign with him. But there is a difference, and there are fundamental differences between God's peace and And the world's peace. Well, let me tell you, the world's peace is fleeting and it changes with circumstances. Come with me to the book of Micah, please. The book of Micah. If you find the break between the Old and New Testaments, Micah is the seventh book back from the break. And we find Micah talks about this. Micah talks about this peace that is the world's peace We find it's the same peace that the prophets have been preaching in Jeremiah's day and Micah's day and our day in the day to come when the Lord returns. And we find this, the world's peace is is fleeting. It's not there very long. It's it's changeable with circumstances and situations and, and with politics and all of those things. And it says in Micah chapter 3 and the verse 5, this is, The Lord speaking through the prophet Micah now. 
And he talks about this, this changing. And, and as this peace, it just changes like the wind changes direction. It says in Micah 3 verse 5, Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. Now this is the Lord speaking against the apostasy that preach a false peace. And it says, Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace. In other words, when their bellies are full, then they cry peace. When things are going well, when they're comfortable, when they have the material things of life, when, when they're bit into things with their teeth, they have it, they, they possess it, they're satisfied, then they cry peace. But then look at the rest of the verse 5. And he that putteth not into their mouths, so when something is withheld from them, when they don't get their own way, when maybe their bellies just aren't as full, it says they even prepare war against him. You see, this false peace, well, it's not genuine. Or oh, the prophets that are false, they, they preach a peace, but they preach a false peace, and they only preach peace when it's going their way. And they preach a peace that will get them material gain and will feed their bellies and feed their carnal and fleshly lusts. But when things don't go their way and they're not enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, it says then they prepare war against them. Oh, you see, this, this peace of the world, it's, it's changeable with circumstances. It's not solid. It's not firm. It's not guaranteed. That's the world's peace for you. But you see, the world's peace is also built on compromise. Come with me to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34 and the verse 12. We find a, a little more about this. It's very interesting when uh, we look at it. But we find now that the children of Israel, they have uh, escaped and been delivered from Egyptian bondage. They've crossed the Red Sea. They're now starting to come through various other nations on their way to the promised land. And we read in Exodus chapter 34, and look with me at the verse 12, the Lord tells them something very, very important concerning the world's peace and how the world's peace is built on compromise. <clears throat> it says, Exodus 34 verse 12, take heed to thyself. In other words, take note to what you're about to do. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant or make a peace agreement, that's what the word is meaning, with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. You see, Israel could have had peace. Israel could have had false peace with, with the heathen nations, with the paganism all around them. Same for us today in the church of Jesus Christ. Oh, oh, there's plenty the world would love us to do. In fact, you know what the world would love us to do? They'd love us to lock those doors, to walk away from here permanently, to never preach the gospel again. And you see, the world's peace, to keep the world satisfied, to keep the world happy. Well, my friend, if you do all of those things and feed their carnal lust, then you can have all the false peace in the world. But if you don't do that, you're going to stand for truth. If you're going to stand for God, then the Word of God says, don't, don't make a covenant with those people, uh, lest there be a snare in the midst of thee. You see, compromise and this false peace, it, it's not helpful for the believer. That's why I believe, uh, we believe in biblical separation. That's why we believe that we have a peace that the, the Lord gives, and it's a peace the world could never give, or that we would love and learn this. But then I want you to now not focus necessarily on the world's fleeting and compromised peace, but note this from Isaiah 54 now. Turn there with me. Isaiah 54 and the verse 10. Note this. In comparison to all that we've just noted, that the world's peace is fleeting, the world's peace changes in circumstances, the world's peace is based on compromise. Well, God's peace, genuine peace, is permanent and secure and guaranteed forever. Look what it says in Isaiah 54 and the verse 10. Isaiah 54 and the verse 10, it says, For the mountains shall depart, 
and the hills shall and the hills be removed but my kindness shall not depart from thee neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed saith the lord that hath mercy on thee what beautiful words they are. Oh yes, in, in Micah's day, the prophets only preached peace when, when their bellies were full. But there we find the Lord promising through the prophet Isaiah that even if the mountains would have become a plain and even if the hills would have become a valley, even if literally everything in our world were to be turned upside down and changed for the worse, there we are guaranteed no matter what happens all around us, my peace, God's peace, shall never be removed. Does that not encourage you? You know, sometimes we look at the mountains that we have to face. We look at them and we gaze at them and we think, how can I ever conquer that mountain? How will I ever get through today? How will I ever face that colleague that doesn't like me? How will I ever talk to that family member or that friend? And maybe sometimes you have it where literally every single burden that could be on you has been on you and seems to be multiplied by 10 as well. And you say, if anything goes wrong more, I don't know what I'll do. Well, listen, the peace of God, it doesn't matter what happens, the peace of God shall not be removed. Even if the mountains of morn were to disappear tonight, God's peace will not be removed. Oh, what a peace this is that the Lord gives that the world cannot give. But then, last of all and very quickly, we see the comfort, the care, the caution. Now, number four, the compassion. The compassion. Why does the Lord tell us about his genuine peace? Why does the Lord tell us that, that we can have peace with God? Why does the Lord tell us that there is a difference between his peace and the world's peace? Why does the Lord tell us any of these things? Well, he tells us because he has compassion on us. And look what it says in John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Why are you telling us these things, Lord? Look at it further, verse 27. With all of this in mind about my peace, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Oh, don't have the spirit of fear. Don't have a spirit of trouble. Because no matter what we have to face, if we have God's peace, then we have all that we need. So let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see the compassion of the Lord here. He has given us his genuine peace, and he's told us about his genuine peace so that our hearts that so often are troubled won't be troubled, so that our fears that so often come upon us that they'll be allayed. Oh, what a wonderful Savior we serve. Because of what we have learned, he says, don't be troubled. Look at the verses 1 and 2. Further to this, talking about peace he gives in this world, yes, but peace he gives in the world to come. Look what it says in the first three verses of John 14. He repeats it. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't let it bother you. Don't get stirred up by it. Let not your heart be troubled. Why? Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. You're not just bowing before a God made of wood or a stone. You're not on your own. You're not looking to a man that will fail you and disappoint you. Let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because you believe in God, and therefore you have my peace, his peace, peace that is genuine peace. It says in the verse 2, Then in my Father's house are many mansions. Oh, what peace this brings our heart. If it were not so, I would have told you. The Lord who... It says in the Scriptures, it is impossible for God to lie. He says, it's not a lie. It's not a falsehood. If, if it were not so, I would have told you. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. In verse 3, he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, look at it, wonderful words, I will come again. The return of the Lord. The Lord's coming back, you know. And it says, and receive you unto myself. The where I am, there ye may be also. I ask you, my friend, when you look at the compassion of the Lord, are you saved yet? Do you know what it is to have your troubles and your fears allayed and gone and dispelled? Do you know what it is yet to have the peace of God reigning in your heart? And 
to know that heaven is your home. If not, then I ask you, why not? Repent and believe the gospel before it's too late. You know, my friend, we're not to be troubled because we have God, we have a home, and we have salvation. But then look at the next phrase as we draw to a close. It says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Look at the verse 3 again. We find the Trinity in all of these things. <clears throat> we find because our God is a triune God, that therefore we need not be afraid. We find in the verse 3, it says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. So that adds to our peace. That adds to our fears being allayed because Christ is coming again for us. The one that died for us. The one that shed his blood for us. The one that purchased us upon the tree. He, the very Christ, is coming again. The one that in this verse cries, I am alive forevermore. He says, I will come again. There you find Christ. Then in the verse 26, you find the Spirit. It says of the Holy Spirit, verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So there we find there's peace because there's a promise. Christ is coming again. Well, what about the meantime? In the meantime, the Spirit is with us. The Spirit lives within us. The Spirit can infill us. The Spirit is with us every step of the way. The Comforter has come. And then not only do we see the Son, we see the Spirit, but we, we see the Father in John 14. Look what it says in the verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. Where are we going? We're, we're going to the Father's house. In the verse 26 again it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. There we find the Father's provision. There we find the Father's watchful eye. There we find the Father loving us and keeping us. You know, my friend, there is a peace that is given. It's a God-given peace. But it is a peace that allows us not to be troubled and not to be afraid because all three persons of the Godhead are watching over us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And therefore, with all of this in mind, I, I encourage you, Christian, be encouraged tonight. Oh, yes, there, there is so much to trouble us. There, there is so much to cause us fear. There is so much to cause us anxiety. But we have the peace of God, and there is nothing like it. It is a peace that passeth all understanding. But my sinner friend, I ask you, if you don't yet have the peace of God, then I mean it when I say, it. what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Why, why won't you come to him? Why won't you trust him? For the word of God tells us, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the verse 6 of our chapter, it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I ask you, what are you waiting for? Why do you stay with the world's peace, the false peace, the false peace that will only cause you trouble and fear? I trust tonight you'll be saved. And you'll know that the Lord is speaking directly to you as his child. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Genuine God-given peace. Let's bow in a word of prayer, please, together. Every head bowed and every eye closed as we come before the Lord. And as we still ourselves in the Lord's presence, I, I want to ask you, my friend, do you have God's peace yet? Have you trusted him? You know, Christian, at time we can be guilty of forgetting the Lord's peace. At time we can be guilty of letting the fear of the world and the trouble around us just overcome our spirits. I wonder, has that been your situation in recent days where the world has come against you, the fears of life have come against you? Well, the Lord gives peace. Not just any peace, but His peace. 
And it's not. It's not peace as the world giveth. I trust that today your heart will not be troubled and your soul will not be afraid. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the encouragement of the Scriptures of truth. We pray that Thou bless Thy people tonight. Undertake for each one. Encourage them in the Lord. And Lord, we pray that all of our troubles and all of our fears may be dispelled as we trust in Thy genuine peace. Take us to our homes in safety and bless us till we meet again. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.